about as long as the children of Israel were wandering around the wilderness. And it hasn't been 40 years, but it's, it's been about four months, I think. And we've had a good time learning what God has to say to us through Joshua and the experience of the people, the children of Israel. Now, we know that they were held captive in the land of Egypt. And after several hundred years, God fulfilled his promise by setting them free, setting the stage, the right time, the right moment for the leader to emerge. He chose Moses to lead them out of bondage in Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. Now, we know there were a few glitches along the way. They got there about two years after they they started their journey. It's tough to move a million people that far, that fast. And so they got there, they went in, they spied the place out, and there were the majority of the, the people that went in said, you know what, you know what, can't do it, can't do it. So go back to the way you just had it, okay? You just changed it and it, it's, all, it's all deep and bassy now. Go back to the way you had it. All right, so, um, so anyway, they go back into the land and they say, we can't do this. And so they wandered around then for how many more years, remember? 38 more years, right, wandering until now they come back to the promised land. They get to the promised land and they say, we are going in this time. No ifs, ands, or buts, we are going in. And so they go in, they conquer the territory, and now here we are at the very last stages of the story of Joshua. And Joshua now, they've conquered the land, they're ready to go, and they say, okay, here's the deal. You've got your new territory. God has been faithful. He's given you everything he promised you. All the good promises of God have been fulfilled. And then he turns to the whole nation and he says, so, are you going to stay with it? Are you going to stay with it? Let me read it for you, okay? Joshua 24, verses 14 through 15 says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods, little g gods, of your forefathers, the ones they worship beyond the river in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods with a small g of your forefathers, the ones they served on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, another small g god, in the land that you're living in right now. So they had to make a choice. Now, this group of people behind me here made a choice to serve God in Mexico last week. And uh, it wasn't an easy choice. Now, I want to know from you guys, uh, we've got a microphone here that we can use right there. Okay, great, great. Um, what does it mean for you guys to serve the Lord? And how did that find expression this last week when you were serving in Mexico? All right? Okay. Well, I'm Ivan, and uh, uh, to me, serving means... Um, putting myself in a spot where you're available to do whatever you need to do. And in this case, when we went to Mexico, it was to either cut wood or, or make cement or whatever. And that's something that I took back here where even though I'm not building a house every day from now on, I, I should wake up in the morning and, and think about how can I put myself available so that I can build someone's spirit or or um, just bring hope to somebody that needs it. Great. Somebody else, what does it mean for you to, to serve the Lord, and how did that find expression down in Mexico this last week? Um, hi, I'm Angela. Uh, one of the things that I was reminded of on this trip is that um, service, uh, the, the choice to serve is kind of continuous, right? Because we, we did make the choice to go down there for a week. But uh, then I could have, or we all could have chosen to be irritated by the cement making or by the fact that our tent didn't close (laughs) or, you know, but there's this constant um, choice that everyone was making. And there was like, I think 180 of us, right? And you saw that happening, that people were constantly making the choice to serve wherever was needed. And that was really evident when it came to like the really not fun jobs, like shoveling sand and um, a lot of the sand jobs, sifting sand and carrying buckets of sand, like those were the, the jobs that nobody really wanted to do and people were just so willing to pick up and do whatever was needed and fill the gaps 
And I just saw that kind of happening over and over, people just saying like, uh, you know, what do I need to do right now? And people filling that gap. And so I think that for me, I came back wanting to do that every day, like looking for the little things during the day where I can serve and be open to that, even if it's maybe not the most fun one. Somebody else, how did you serve, find expression to serve down there? Um, I'm Ryan, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> hi. Um, I think the definition of service is putting someone else's needs before your own. And um, a trip like this, you'd be hard pressed to find another time where um, every element of what you're doing isn't service. Whether, I mean, even when we're not, uh, when we weren't building houses, you're still serving at the camp, you're still doing work for the kitchen, you're still, you know, helping people fix their tents and doors that won't close. Um, and it's so difficult to put others' needs before yourself, but um, that's really what the whole week is about. Well, now, as you guys were serving, too, um, we know that service is not just a decision, it's a process, right? And uh, as you guys were serving down there, did you find yourself doing the things that you were equipped to do, or maybe there were some surprises along the way? Um, how hard was it to serve while you were down there, and what was what the process you went through to find maybe your niche of what you were going to do while you were down there? Um, I think that what was um, kind of difficult for me about doing this kind of service is that I, uh, building a house isn't my strength. So um, it was hard to kind of step back and try to figure out where my niche was and um, accept that I guess this is where I kind of felt broken. That was the theme of our whole trip where I didn't feel like I was really good at any of this stuff. So um, I just had to let people give me directions rather than kind of being in so much in a place of leadership. Um, I was a helper, but it was really cool to see, like I felt a little discouraged about that one day when I just felt like I wasn't doing any, I didn't feel like I was that helpful. Um, but in the evening we have these small groups and one person just pointed out that it was really cool how our team still comes together and everybody has their own purpose. Like everybody, um, you know, helped out in whatever way they could and every part was important, equally important because everything needed to get done. And so it didn't matter if you were the one giving directions or if you were the one receiving directions about how to do things, um, everything was just as important and necessary. So that um, made me feel a little bit better about, <laughs> about that. Anybody else finding your niche? How did how'd that go? Um, I think one of my little, like, the niche, I guess, would be, like, this guy taught me how to hammer, and I really liked hammering, just for whatever reason, I just liked doing it, and so, I, I liked it, yeah, isn't that weird, you wouldn't know, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so Smash I liked, <laughs> so you like smashing yeah, things, yeah, and I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really end up hurting myself, I mean, like, well, okay, well, anyway, um, I just, like, yeah, I... She was swinging a hammer and just clocked herself in the knee. She wasn't hammering anything. She was just playing with it. <laughs> Bam! Oh, sit down. Have a break. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> but other than that, like, I really, like, that was kind of, like, my niche, like, I guess, is, like, just tell me, like, what to hammer, and I was just, like, all over it. I don't know, I just, I don't know why, but, like, yeah. So, like, that was just kind of my thing, and, like, because I liked it, I found that I was working, like, really hard at it, and it actually surprised myself, like, how hard I was working over that trip, like, just, like, I really wanted to, like, build an entire wall or whatever, and Ange and I did that, and we felt so good, and, like, it was just, like, that was, that was my niche, like, personally, it was just, like, like, just getting, like, 100% into what I was doing, and in this case, it was hammering. So, so when you were down there, you, of course, you didn't do the same thing all the time. There were lots of different things you had to do, but some you were good at, some they were more difficult, and, uh, and some were just surprises, like you mentioned, just playing with kids, yeah. things like that, and uh, seeing families and being able to love on them like that. Um, what's interesting about this passage in Joshua is, is Joshua, he says, now, it's time to serve God. Are you going to choose to serve God or not? Now, th these guys made a choice to go down to Mexico. That's awesome. Um, we're all faced with that choice. What does it mean for us to serve God? And we've got choices every day to serve God, right? And serving God means so many different things. It means hammering yourself in the knee. It means, uh, you know, playing with little kids or sawing wood. Um, whatever it is, it's putting other people's needs before your own. I love what you said there about that. And Joshua here, he doesn't take yes for an answer. It's very interesting. 
He says, choose today whom you are going to serve. And they, they say it in, in verses 16 to 18. They go, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. I mean, the, the whole bunch of people. Yeah, we're in this thing, all right? And uh, now when you say yes, you got down there and there are surprises, just like there were with the people of Israel. When you say yes to God, all of a sudden he's asking you to do certain things that you maybe don't feel equipped to do that are kind of out of your bubble of comfort. Um, what are some of the things that, uh, that you would say um, were surprises for you that were kind of like, whoa, I didn't really plan on this one? Because I, I think what Joshua is saying here is, um, take a second look here, be very careful about making this decision because when you make this decision, there's gonna be a lot more involved in this following God than you thought at first. So what are some of the things that kind of came up that you were surprised by that, whoa, I didn't count on this one? So um, <clears throat> when we go down there, the, the standard issue house is 11 feet by 22 feet, and it has sort of rake wall, slanted roof sort of thing. And that's a challenge to build for a team of uh, 13 to 15 people. And so this year they said, oh yeah, your team, the teal team is what we were. <laughs> Yeah, we were teal for real, is what we went by. That was, that was, you guys are like trained. No, um, me too. So uh, they told us, you guys are going to build a double house. So it's going to be 22 by 22. And not only that, um, they want a custom job done because they have a lot of kids, and so we need to build some additional bedrooms into this. And so all the plans that you have, you got to kind of redraw them and, uh, and, and do that. And so... And so it's like, well, you think, oh, well, we get a bigger team. Well, our team had like three more people. Um, so instead of six walls, we built 12. And instead of an 11 foot by a 22 foot slab, we built 22, it's like 400 square feet of hand mixed concrete. And so um, challenges that from the first day when we got out there, I was like, this is different than any of these trips I've taken before. This is not what I expected. Um, this is hard. And every person on that team worked so hard. Um, I don't think the people that had been there for the first time realized just how hard they were working, maybe comparatively to past years, but it was an unforeseen thing, but it got done and you know, God's spirit was in it, so. Good, what are some other things that maybe surprised you a little bit when you got down there? <clears throat> Uh, well, for me, the, the double house was, was also a big deal because it is, I've, this is my fifth time going and that's my first time doing a, a double house and it just felt like um, the work was just never ending. I mean, you, you're, I, I don't know how to describe that because you're always working really hard on, on every team, but this just felt like we'd pour so much concrete and we'd never, never fill the slab. Or, but so we got to the last day and um, uh, I think we had like two hours before we had to clear out of the site because they had very specific rules about when you leave for safety reasons. And uh, we hadn't even begun to stucco the house yet. That's the last step is to stucco it all up. And that's normally a whole day activity for a regular size house. And so um, I was kind of starting to panic and worry a little bit. Uh, the last time we went due to rain, we didn't get to finish our house. And that was really kind of disappointing. We were like determined to finish it this year. And so um, this was one of my favorite moments of the trip, actually, because about an hour and a half before we had to leave, we hadn't even started stuccoing. Our um, other teams that had finished just started coming in and like flooded our work site. And all of a sudden, there's like 30 more people, and they just grabbed trowels and they grabbed hose and they started mixing this, the the um, stucco, and all and it just went up. I don't know. It like one wall went up in like 20 minutes. It was insane. And you just had all these people. The family, the family's eyes were like. <laughs> where, where are all these people coming from? All these white people showed up, you know, and, and except Ivan and John. And, um, <laughs> and uh, it was so crowded to stucco. I mean, you didn't even have room to like step over. You had your little space and the whole thing was done in like an hour and 10 minutes. And it was just to me this testament of God's uh, plan and provision and also just the unity of the church. Like these teams weren't like, dude, we already worked so hard today. We don't, you know, we don't need you or we don't want to help. It was just this sense of like, we are all in this together. There was no sense of competition. It was like, we are going to do this for the family. And, and it was amazing. But that definitely was a challenge because it was a bit scary. I thought we weren't going to finish again. And, um, but it was one of, ended up being one of my favorite moments. So, um, so God really stepped up and gave you everything you needed, yeah, right? Yeah, he kind of did that a lot. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, Joshua, he tells the people now, okay, if you're going to serve, 
Take stock, make sure that you are in this thing, that it's not just lip service. I mean, really, maybe talk to some people that have been in it before. It's kind of a good idea to have some, some previous knowledge. But one of the things that he goes on to, to tell the people of Israel, he says, okay, you've made this commitment, you've considered the cost, you wanna follow Jesus. Um, then he goes on and he says, here, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. And they say, yeah, we're witnesses against ourselves. So he goes, now then, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the God of Israel. One of the things that you have to think about when you're serving God is that there is a cost to it. There's, there are things that you have to give up in order to be able to go and serve and put yourself available, make yourself available to do what you guys did. Now, what are some of the things that you had to give up and some of these things you, you gave up before. You said, okay, I gotta give up maybe some vacation time or I've gotta give up some money or I've gotta give up, you know, whatever. Um, were there some things that you were surprised about when you got there? You go, ooh, I gotta give up this, gotta give up that. Um, what are some of the things that are, were hard to give up that might be considered things that, you know, we really enjoy, really desire? What are some things? Um, something that I felt that I needed to give up was um just this mindset of being selfish. Um, here you wake up and, and the first thing you do is like, oh, I'm gonna make this for myself, I'm gonna do this. You plan a whole list of things that you need to do for yourself. But when you're out there with a whole bunch of people with the same mindset that we get up and we wanna do something for somebody else and you don't think about yourself, you don't think about, um, well, basically yourself, uh, you just are, thinking on the goal that you need to finish this house, but at the same time, you, you feel so much bigger because you are bringing hope and, and, and just joy to this family that doesn't have anything. And one thing that we talked about is in our little small groups, because we had some over there, um, we were blessing the family, but at the same time, because we were able to communicate a little bit more uh, with the family, we were, well, yeah, me, but you guys too. <laughs> These guys knew enough Spanish, but um, we were not only just blessing that family, but we were blessing everybody around it, all the, all the neighbors. They, they would just gather and sit there and watch, and it didn't really click in there until uh, one of the pastors from that ministry, the Amor ministry, came on that last night, and he explained that um, our job doesn't really end with our building of the house. There's so much more that is being built in people's hearts, their hope, their faith, because they see a whole bunch of people like us coming in there and helping out. And um, it's just, you just gotta give, we had this mentality of just giving up everything about ourselves and just giving so much to somebody else. And that was really cool. Cool. What are some of the other things that you gave up when you were down there? Some of the things that uh, you had to, I had to work on giving up was like, like you know, like the nice showers and the flushing toilets and stuff like that. Like Angela and Kristen and I had fun with bucket showers and not having any, any warm water to use and just like pouring it over the other person and we'd sit there and just kind of squeal and kind of try and keep it in and help each other like, you can get through this, like it's just one more bucket full and like, um, that was really fun and you just have to be able to give up all the comforts and luxuries you have like you know You're gonna go in and camp, but it's just like it's kind of easier said than done Like you're gonna go camping and it's gonna be really really dusty and you're not gonna have a tent flap that closes So you get to change with an open tent flap and like <laughs> that's really fun Like you just have to be able to expect things Expect something different like it's like and you can't have a bad attitude when it happens Like you can't just get all sour about that tent flap You have to make it funny and have somebody stand there and just make jokes about it and um, And you just have to not let every little thing get you down because like, your attitude would just be so sour the whole trip Like you just have to make sure like consciously like you're not gonna have warm water and all that stuff So that was something that you definitely had to work on giving up So so this this God thing that we kind of set up are things that either are We've got to kind of adjust our attitude to say, well, this is not really about me. It's not something that I want or something that's going to make me feel better, or something that's more convenient for me. But uh, you've got to learn to release those things. And I think for us, when we're called to serve God, we've got to take stock too. I mean, if we're going to 
serve God in any way. Maybe it's, it's to go down and help with the homeless or go to, to the, the soup kitchen and get on the other end of a spoon and serve somebody that way or, or help with children's ministry or you, some of you guys, you, you help set up and tear down this venue. Uh, whatever it is, it costs something and you've got something greater in mind and you're willing to give up something that gives you a feeling of, of pleasure maybe or convenience in order to, to do something better, something grander that makes a difference for somebody else. And I, I think that's something you guys learned that's really cool. Um, now, he says in the scripture here, he says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. There's a, there's a choice that Joshua made to serve God with all this stuff in mind. And then he says, you have to choose for yourself. Now, um, there are some people that didn't go on this trip that you probably wish would have gone, right? I mean, uh, not everybody got to go. Some people wanted to go. Um, what encouragement would you give to them if you could to say, you got to get, get it in gear and go on this thing next time, okay? Okay, so the, <clears throat> the trade-offs that we were just talking about, warm showers, all that stuff, yeah, I mean, it's funny uh, that you take a shower with a bucket of cold water um, at 7 o'clock in the evening or, or whatever it is, um, and, and you miss that. I mean, I, everybody gets back to the hotel room when we get over the border and just, just wrecks the hot water heater system in the hotel because everybody runs for the showers. And that's all well and good, but um, the trade-off between the two, there's a, you were saying like God's little G and God big G, there's a reason for that little G. Uh, hot water shower is such a little G God compared to the trade-off of what the, the joy that you're getting through serving. You know what I'm saying? Um, just when, when you kind of just step out and do that, you kind of compare the look on a family's face that just received the keys to their house that they didn't have a week ago, and now they have a roof over their head, and you're like, oh man, I don't get a shower tonight. What? I mean, that's just, just, just not... Um, there's, just, there's just no comparison to, to, um, to what you're giving up versus, versus what you're getting out of it. So. Cool. Somebody else? Uh, one of the really cool things that I love about this trip is that you, are, you meet and you interact with the family that you're building for all week long. Right? So it's not like you just build some house and you never get to see who gets it and lives in it. You're constantly in contact with this family. They're there. Um, our family, it had um, a mom and dad and five kids and the oldest son who I think was, in, was 20 or 21 and the dad, when they got off work, they'd come back and they'd help us. Like they'd work right alongside with us without complaint, without very much communication, but they'd just get in there and we work together. And their little kids were there all the time playing with us and coming out and helping when they could, like sifting sand or painting. And the mom made us this amazing taco dinner. Is that what it was? Taco lunch? Just so good. What? Oh, carne asada. See. And um, it was so good. But you're, you're just with them all the time. And so you get to see this family that, you're, that you are making a difference for. And you get to be touched by them because their generosity and their gratitude and the way they just immediately accept you, it's just this wonderful exchange. And I don't know if people know that, like, yes, we get to go down and build a house, but we get to see who it's going to and we get to hand them a, a Bible and a set of keys and watch them unlock their door for the first time. And it, uh, we bawled, right? Like we're total criers and we cried and it's just, in, it's an incredible experience. And if you, if you're even considering coming, I can promise you, you won't be disappointed. Like God uses this experience to just change you and, and change the people around you too. It's pretty incredible. You know, that's not just, not just the Mexico experience. So, I mean, what we want to get across here today is that Joshua says, choose for yourselves whom you're going to serve. And so our lives are either about ourselves or they're about using this life that we have in order to make others' lives better. And Jesus always said we need to look out for the least of these. There are always going to be those who have less than we do, who have need. Uh, there are lots and lots of homeless people and people who have great need, um, who aren't homeless, but have need for emotional support and security and all these things that God says, you can do this. You, you can come together and make a difference in people's lives. I mean, our church is, is about loving God, loving all, and making a difference. 
And we want to use our energies to set aside all the small G stuff, the stuff that is so, you know, so prone to call us into the, this, this life of, of uh, safety, security, uh, satisfaction, pleasure, uh, enjoyment. We get, we get sucked in to the vortex of all these things that call us you know, to help ourselves out, make our life better. And yet God says, you know, together, you can make this huge impact on other people's lives and their lives can be changed and enriched because of you. Now, two more things that, that Joshua says that I wanna point out here. One is he says, choose for yourselves. Now, it's actually a plural, that this choice is actually an easier choice to make when you know others are making it with you. I mean, now, if you chose to go down there by yourself and build a house all alone, you probably wouldn't do it. But the fact that you had 180 people and, and there was encouragement to go down. Other people have been down. They're encouraging to come, saying it's going to be cool. It's going to be great like you guys are encouraging today. That's important for us to realize is that there are all kinds of ways to serve. Inside the church, outside the church, uh, your next door neighbor, the person down the street, whatever it is, there are lots of, of things to do to serve other people. And I think one of the things that we need to, to realize is there is a power in serving together that we can get excited. And it's not just the first person that gets excited that makes it happen. It's usually the second person who comes alongside, the third person, and pretty soon you've got a group and they're all going like, yeah, let's do this thing. And the excitement starts to build and then you've got something really cool going. So I wanna encourage you to be encouragers, right? Um, they're gonna encourage you, like, like, like they're excited about this trip and when next year rolls around, they're going to be saying, yeah, you've got to do it. You, you can't forget. But the other thing that Joshua says here is this. He said, okay, you are saying you want to serve God. Your voice is a witness against yourself. In other words, I heard you say it, and now I'm going to hold you to it. And one of the things that we can do as a church is when somebody steps up and says, you know what? I feel like God is calling me to do whatever it is, X, right? We need to say, okay, we heard you say that, just like when people were baptized a couple weeks ago, and they say, I want to serve God with all my life. This is it. I'm following Jesus from now on. See, we saw them do that, and now we're witnesses to their witness, that what they said they want to do. And so we are now a team to help each other get that done, right? And so what Joshua did is he actually made a stone, and he set it up, and he said, now this stone is our witness, because it's not going away right? It's going to be here. And every time you walk by that rock, it's like that rock is going like, you said you were going to serve God, right? And we need now to be the people that encourage one another to follow through on the commitments that we make. And so I know Ivan, you're sporting one of those little bracelets. Several of you have those little bracelets, right? Um, these bracelets that they made in Mexico, those little colorful ones, those are cool, right? That could serve as a stone for you. Right? Every time you see that, you're reminded, oh, I was down in Mexico, and it reminds me of the commitment that I made that I'm going to do this again. This is not my last time. And so whatever it takes, do a couple of things this week. Examine your commitment to God. Are you in? Are you ready to serve God with everything that you've got? Right? All that you are, you're in. And then the second thing is, look around and say, okay, is there anything that's in my life that's kind of tugging me away from my commitment that could be tempting me not to serve God the way that I say that I really want to. And maybe make your commitment known to other people so they can be your encourager. They can be your witness, if you will. And they come alongside you and they say, don't forget the decision you made to follow God because it's this group that encourages one another. There's not a missionary, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, somebody who goes to Mexico. There's not one person who, who doesn't need encouragement, right? And I had a little lady that led me to Christ when I was four and a half years old. Her, her name was Ida Laycock, right? And I said, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart when I was four and a half years old. And you know what? She prayed for me every single day. When I went back to be a pastor in Visalia back in the 80s, she was still alive. She was living in her little, little trailer, and uh, I got to see her. And she told me, she says, you haven't grown much since I've seen you for a long time, you know? But beyond that, she said, you know what? I have been praying for you every single day. She's in her 80s. 
When she passed, I had a huge hole in my heart because my encourager, my prayer warrior, was passed, right? But her encouragement to pray behind the scenes for so many years, I'm, I'm sure that's part of why God sustained me in ministry. And I've got lots of other people that pray for me, and that's, that's awesome, okay? We can't do it without prayer. Um, but the encouragement that we have for one another to say, you can do it, I see God's, God's servant heart in you. Don't forget that decision that you've made. Let's keep at it. And some of you guys are, are just brand new Christians and you're following God, you know, fresh and new. Some of you are called back and say, I haven't been serving God for a long time. I want to do that. Well, Joshua says, are you going to serve God? And if you say yes, great. Okay, take stock, see what it's going to cost you, and then let's get busy and let's encourage each other. So thank you guys for being a witness to us of what it really means to serve God with all your heart and to give up and sacrifice in order to do that. And uh, they're going to be mingling among us in the weeks and months ahead uh, just to encourage us to, to, to do similar to what they did, right? Now, I think you guys got a slideshow you're going to show us? Uh, yeah, that's right. Is that cool? Of course. Okay, awesome.
I call you 